Hey everyone, welcome to another lesson. This lesson is on dengue fever. So we're gonna talk about how we become infected with dengue fever, what are some of the signs and symptoms. We're also gonna talk about how we diagnose it and how we can treat it. So dengue fever is an illness due to an infection with a virus of the family Flaviviridae. And there are a subset of Flaviviridae viruses known as the dengue viruses. So there are actually four dengue viruses and we name them DENV1 to DENV4, so DENV1 to DENV4. They are all enveloped viruses. We're going to talk about why this is important a little later. And they're all positive single-stranded RNA viruses. Now, dengue fever is an important cause of what we call a fever in a returned traveler. So what that means is that if there is a traveler to a perhaps exotic locale, and they come back to their home country and they have a fever, dengue fever actually accounts for about 5% of those cases. So where are some of those exotic locales? So most of them are in tropical and subtropical climates. And a couple in particular that I want you to think about are the Caribbean and Southeast Asia. So how do we get infected with this virus? We actually get it from our lovely friends, the mosquitoes, once again. And the mosquitoes in particular are the species Aedes aegypti, which is actually the same mosquito that can infect us with yellow fever, and the related species Aedes albopictus. So what is the pathogenesis of dengue fever? Once we actually become infected, once a mosquito bites us in our skin, the viruses can actually fuse with a host cell. Now there are some theories as to what some of the host cells might be, some theories are that they are the Langerhans cells in our skin, which is an immune cell. Whatever that host cell might be, the dengue virus fuses with that cell and enters the cell. So how does it fuse with the cell? It's actually mediated by the viral envelope E glycoprotein, which is important for infectivity. So that is actually how the dengue virus can attach to a host cell and enter that host cell. What are some of the viral receptors that it attaches to? Well, some of these receptors include heparin sulfate that is located on the host cell. There's some other ones as well, but we won't talk about them here. Once the virus enters the cell, it gets packaged into an endosome, an acidified vacuole, and it eventually becomes disassembled into its viral RNA. Once that viral RNA has been exposed it can become replicated inside the cell. And once we have enough viral replication, the virus actually assembles, and we can think about it assembling in the ER, or the endoplasmic reticulum. Once the virus has assembled, it can mature into a virion through the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. It can get packaged again, and it can be released to be able to infect other cells. So that is actually the basic process as to how the dengue virus and many other viruses infect host cells. Once that virus leaves that host cell, it can move on to infecting local lymph nodes and can lead to viremia or virus in the blood. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of dengue fever? So dengue fever actually leads to a variable clinical presentation. It can be anywhere from asymptomatic to life-threatening. What we find is that dengue fever is more likely to be asymptomatic in children. Now, when we do become infected with the virus, the incubation period for that virus is on average anywhere from three to 14 days. And there are actually three phases of infection I'm gonna talk about here in the next few slides. The first phase is the febrile phase. The second is the critical phase. And the critical phase doesn't necessarily have to occur in every infection, but we'll talk about what are some of the risk factors for getting this critical phase. And then the third phase is the recovery phase. So each of these phases has different signs and symptoms and different clinical outcomes. So we'll start with the febrile phase. The febrile phase is where this infection begins to become symptomatic. And the symptoms usually begin at day four to day seven. And when we do begin to have symptoms of the febrile phase, the febrile phase lasts for three to seven days. And as its name suggests, it has a fever. And the fever is a fever of sudden onset. It rapidly and suddenly occurs. 
and it is a high grade fever, greater than 38.5 degrees Celsius. Again, it is a very important cause of fever in the return traveler. Other common symptoms include headache, and we can also get retroorbital eye pain. So pain in behind the eyes, and this is something that will be almost like a key phrase for you. If you hear fever, headache, return traveler, and retroorbital pain, you are thinking dengue fever. So retroorbital pain clues you into this being dengue fever. Patients can also have myalgias or muscle pain and arthralgias or joint pain. And some other symptoms that might not necessarily occur include some gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea and vomiting, diarrhea and abdominal pain. If a patient is having persistent vomiting and abdominal pain, we consider this a worrisome find, which means it could be a more severe presentation. Some other signs and symptoms of the febrile phase include lymphadenopathy, so swollen, tender lymph nodes, hepatomegaly, so an enlarged liver, and this is actually another warning sign that may indicate a severe presentation of dengue fever. We can also see a maculopapular rash. So maculopapular rash, like here in this image. So we can see this reddened, flat, or perhaps slightly raised rash and it occurs in approximately 50% of cases. And it's more common in the first dengue infection. So if someone gets dengue fever for the first time, they're more likely to have the maculopapular rash compared to if they were to be infected with dengue fever a second or third time. And the maculopapular rash generally erupts about two to five days after fever has started. And dengue fever can have some other symptoms that are less common, including respiratory symptoms like cough, nasal congestion, and sore throat. And some of the more worrisome things that can happen in the febrile phase in dengue fever are the findings of leukopenia or low white blood cell count, thrombocytopenia or low platelet count, and transaminitis or elevated liver enzymes like ALT and AST. So these only happen in a small subset of febrile phase patients, but if they do, they are again a worrisome sign that this is a severe dengue fever. So what is the critical phase? So the critical phase occurs again in a small subset of patients. Most patients have the febrile phase and they recover fine, but some get this more severe presentation. And the critical phase of dengue fever is more likely to occur in the following cases. Having a secondary infection of dengue fever. And what I mean by secondary infection is that they've had a previous dengue fever infection before, they recovered, they were fine, and then they get it again. And a lot of times it's with another dengue serotype. Remember we said there are four different dengue viruses. If they were to be infected with one of those and then they're infected again with a second different dengue serotype, then they are more at risk for having the critical phase. In particular, if they've had that first infection within 18 months of the second infection. So again, if they had a primary infection and within 18 months, they get another infection with a different dengue virus, they're more likely to enter the critical phase of dengue fever infection. And critical phase of infection is also more common or occurs more often in patients with other medical comorbidities. If the critical phase does occur, it occurs about three to seven days into the infection after defervescence, which means that it's after the fever has resolved. And the critical phase lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. And what we see in the critical phase is thrombocytopenia, so low platelet count, and it can be very severe, even less than a count of 20. And because of the low platelet count, we see increased risk of bleeding. So we can see hematochesia, so red blood in the stool, melena or black tarry stool, hematemesis, so vomiting up of blood, epistaxis, so nosebleeds, and even menorrhagia or heavy menstrual periods. So all of these can occur due to that very low platelet count. And these symptoms are often what we call dengue hemorrhagic fever. Now this term is not often used anymore. We can still hear it, but a lot of times now we describe dengue fever as mild or severe. So we may still hear dengue hemorrhagic fever. This is essentially what this means. You get very severe thrombocytopenia and increased risk of bleeding. So again, we may see the beginning of the thrombocytopenia in the febrile phase, not always, but we can. But if it does occur in the febrile phase, it's not as severe as it would be in the critical phase. And in the critical phase, we may also see vascular leakage. So there's so much inflammatory cytokines that it can lead to leakage out of the intravascular space. We can lose intravascular volume, leading to hypotension or shock. 
And this can lead to a variety of organ impairments. It can cause acute kidney injury, it can cause liver failure, and central nervous system involvement. So these signs and symptoms are what we call dengue shock syndrome. But like dengue hemorrhagic fever, the term dengue shock syndrome is not being used as often. We actually prefer to use newer criteria that describes dengue fever without warning symptoms, with warning symptoms, or severe dengue fever. So these would be considered part of severe dengue fever, but you may still hear the term dengue hemorrhagic fever. So think about thrombocytopenia and the bleeding or dengue shock syndrome, where we can think of vascular leakage leading to hypertension and shock and organ impairment. So again, older terms that are still being used, but we may use other types of terminology nowadays. And the third phase is the recovery phase. So recovery phase, as its name suggests, is essentially resolution of all those problems we talked about. Resolution of vascular permeability and the hemorrhagic risk. The vital signs also stabilize. But you may also see an eruption of a new rash, similar to the first rash. So again, it looks exactly the same. It's a maculopapular rash. And it may be puritic, so it may be itchy. And it usually lasts about one to five days. And what often happens is that even though these patients may recover, they may experience chronic fatigue, which can be debilitating for them. And this can last for weeks to months. So how do we make the diagnosis and how do we treat dengue fever? So the diagnosis is through generally serology. We can look for anti-dengue IgM, so immunoglobulin M antibodies against dengue virus. And these can be detected by about day four of infection. Before that, we may have to use PCR to detect viral genomes or viral genetics. And the treatment of dengue fever is often supportive. A lot of times patients recover on their own and there is spontaneous resolution. We can use acetaminophen for symptom relief, but we want to avoid using ibuprofen or Advil due to its anticoagulation properties because we've talked about before, we have decreased thrombocytes or decreased platelet count. So we don't want to decrease platelet functioning by using ibuprofen or Advil. So we avoid using this. And we can try to prevent getting dengue fever in the first place. And we can use a dengue vaccination. But unfortunately, even if you get the dengue vaccine, you may not be fully protected against dengue infections. But the good news is that having a dengue vaccination reduces the symptoms and the length of infection. So again, diagnosis of dengue fever is by looking for anti-dengue IgM antibody that is usually present by day four of infection. Treatment is often supportive. This is a viral infection, so we don't have the right tools to fight this infection. We can use acetaminophen for symptom relief for helping with headaches and retroorbital pain, but we want to avoid Advil due to the bleeding risk. And we can try to prevent the dengue fever in the first place by using a dengue vaccination. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. So live, laugh, and continue to always learn. And thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.